your presentation today, as I'm sure this particular audience is. Uh, COVID brings some really critical questions to mind for all of us, but particularly I think that interplay between migrants and how we build a world over the next 12, 18 months, which is going to be safe for all of us. Uh, and I think that's something which, uh, you know, we all have a stakeholding in. So thank you very much. Look forward to hearing what you say. Seja bem-vindo a Dublin virtualmente. And uh, look very much forward to, to, to hearing what you have to say. So thank you very much. Antonio, over to you. <laughs> thank you. Muito obrigado. Thank you, Rudy, for your introduction. And uh, also, I take this opportunity to thank you for all the support that the Irish Aid has been uh, giving to uh, IOM. And it's a pleasure to see David uh, again. Uh, it's it's uh, and even more rewarding because not, jo not only David played the key role in the New York Declaration that uh, is essential for IOM today after the adoption of the Global Compact, but also it is an opportunity for us all to pay tribute to the memory of Peter Sutherland, a very good friend, a very close friend, a friend that has helped us all very much to get to the point uh, where we are. I would propose to you to divide my introduction in three parts. The first one, what takes uh, my sleep at night? The second one, a few good news. And the third one about the future of mobility, which is something that is uh, concerning me uh, quite a lot. The first, the first part about the challenges that IOM is facing due to the COVID-19 crisis, I will start by what is self-evident, the situation in the camps, in the camps of refugees, in the camps of migrants, in the camps of internally displaced people, a little bit uh, all, over, all over the world. The good news is that the COVID-19 uh, crisis has not yet arrived in full shape to the camps, but it's just a question of time. And camps are a very prone to disease environment, as you can imagine. Social distance is impossible in the camps. Uh, we have done quite a lot of work in Cox's Bazaar or in other places in trying to prevent and to raise awareness of the camp's population. But unfortunately, we have to re register 200 infected cases in mainland Greece. UNHCR uh, um, took notice of the first uh, infection case in the Greek islands. We have five active cases in Cox's Bazaar, in uh, host population of Bangladeshis, where there are more than 120 uh, 20 infected cases and uh, in uh, environments where we have to deal with conflict and instability. Uh, IOM is quite used to that as you know because we had to deal with the Ebola crisis in West Africa and more recently in North Kivu amid a conflict and uh, tribal and terrorist uh, activities but in fact in Yemen the situation is for the time being clearly underreported, but we are very concerned with the situation in Yemen or in the IDP camps uh, in West Africa and in the Sahel. Just to give you an idea, only in the mouth of March, uh, IDPs in Burkina, Mali and Niger have grown by 33%. Uh, new 370,000 people internally displaced. And if you look to Latin America, you will see that uh, the uh, COVID-19 crisis, the insecurity, the loss of jobs to Venezuelan migrants has uh, started a process of return of Venezuelans back to Venezuela. And we are talking about uh, a small number for the time being. If you consider that in Colombia, you have 1.8 million Venezuelans, but uh, 52,000 are now returning back to Venezuela in large crowds, walking and without any sanitary uh, conditions. So camps and movement of migrants are a source of enormous concern and they are environments very much prone to the spread of the disease. My second concern, uh, I may you may recall that uh, uh, in the negotiation of the Global Compact on Migration, 
one of the most serious issues and the controversial one was to guarantee the access to basic services to migrants in the countries of destination and in the countries of transit. And especially there was the very famous discussion for those who joined this, who follow these discussions about the firewalls, uh, establishing firewalls in access to basic services uh, in order to prevent uh, basic services to be used as a migration enforcement mechanism. And at the end of the day, in the Global Compact, uh, the firewalls were not taken on board. And then last year, if you recall also in the General Assembly of the United Nations, there was a debate about the, uh, the declaration on uh, universal health coverage. And the last point to be agreed, and one of the most controversial ones, was precisely uh, should migrants be entitled to universal health coverage. And finally, at the end, migrants were included. Well, this crisis, this COVID-19 crisis, is the best demonstration how important universal health coverage is. Because if we do not guarantee access of migrants, irrespective of their legal status, to health care, to health services, to tracking and uh, testing and treatment, it's the entire community that is under threat. And if you look to what happened in Singapore, it's a very interesting example because the Singaporeans were very effective in containing the pandemic, but they left quite a large number of migrants outside the system. And then suddenly you had a focus of infection in the migrant community and you had to close down again and to have a specific dedicated focus on uh, tracking and testing uh, the migrants themselves. So access to health, universal health access to health is the first key lesson to be taken from this uh, major uh, pandemic. Then my third issue of concern are the urban slums where large parts of uh, uh, migrants live, both in the developed world and in the developing world in very precarious conditions. Uh, with uh, self, often uh, depending on informal economy, where distancing is not possible, where quarantines or lockdowns uh, mean being deprived of uh, basic uh, income. If you look to what is happening in Brazil, or if you look to what is happening in Mexico, you will see how in those, in those slums, uh, the disease is spreading quite fast, and there are uh, huge numbers of people dying. The same can be said, for instance, of migrants in detention or in uh, uh, collective deportations and expulsions. And the UN Migration Network has just published two important statements, one on alternatives to detention for migrants and the other one on asking a halt, a stop in collective deportations uh, in order to guarantee that the migrants are not exposed to the uh, pandemic. But of course, and this is my third concern, is about uh, the economic impacts of this COVID-19 pandemic. And what we are seeing is that uh, usually migrants work in sectors that are very seriously hit by the lockdowns, by the travel restrictions, by the economic crisis in construction, uh, in tourism, even in uh, home care uh, for the elderly. And of course, those people are losing their jobs, creating two very concerning impacts. The first one is the situation of the stranded migrants. With borders closed, with the travel restrictions, with lockdowns, we have thousands and thousands of migrants that uh, some of them want to return home because they have no further hope of finding a job in the countries of destination. And others were on the move and were blocked by the border closures. And we have large amounts of them living together in very precarious conditions, whether it is in the border of Ethiopia with Djibouti or whether in West and Central Africa, in Nigeria, in Niger, people who are very difficult to reach for health care, people who are living in 
in very precarious conditions and, of course, in an environment that will fuel the spread of the disease. But there is a second element which is extremely important. If uh, migrants in countries of destination lose their jobs, there will be a significant impact in the drop of remittances to countries of origin. The World Bank has a forecast, has a forecast of a reduction of 20% of uh, in drop of remittances this year because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the socioeconomic crisis associated with it. And there are countries that depend on 10% or more of, the, of their G GDP on rem remittances for migrants. So in countries of origin, it's not only just the direct socioeconomic impact of the pandemic, it will also be the indirect impact due to the significant drop of uh, remittances from migrants coming from outside. That's why we are dealing with a health crisis, but we are at the same time dealing with its social economic impacts. And one thing cannot be seen uh, without the other. And there is a need to have an integrated approach. That's what IOM is trying to do. And that's the entire UN system is trying to achieve, both with the humanitarian assistance, the health assistance, but also the socioeconomic recovery assistance. Now, the good news. The good news, I think, is that uh, it's very interesting to see that uh, uh, several countries have had a positive response to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in their own territories. For instance, in Portugal, I'm sorry to give the example of Portugal, but <laughs> it's one of the few I have. <laughs> uh, in Portugal, those migrants who were waiting for a decision on, and asylum seekers who were waiting for a decision, they were granted automatic authorization to stay in the country uh, on a legal basis for the duration of the pandemic. But even more significant, in Italy, the government has just decided to uh, regularize 600,000 irregular migrants that are badly needed for the agriculture and for the industry, precisely to be able to count with that workforce to respond to the uh, impacts of the economic impacts of the COVID-19. And uh, in also in some in cities in the United States, like for instance, Chicago and New York, they are providing cash-based and housing assistance to migrants in need. So there is a certain move in some countries to recognize the need to incorporate migrants in the response of the crisis from the economic, social, and legal point of view. But even more significant than that, in a number of countries, migrants have been considered essential workers. It's a very interesting concept that came out during these debates. Essential workers. And not just the Einstein of this world, not just the highly skilled that was uh, welcomed in the countries of destination. What are essential workers? Well, they are the ones who drive the public transportations that never stop. <clears throat> Those are the ones who are in the supermarkets. Those are the ones who are in the delivery sector. Those are the ones who were in the health care. And in a number of countries, these workers have been recognized as being in the front line of assuring that life could go on in spite of the lockdowns. While the natives were comfortably living in their homes, protected from the virus, those migrants were in the front line working for the cities to go on being delivering the necessary basic services for the entire for the entire community and i could even mention more target the role of migrants in health care systems home care but also in the hospitals in countries like the uk us or canada uh, 30 percent of the doctors are migrants or have a migrant origin in switzerland near half of the doctors are foreign born. And if the OECD figures are correct from 2016, in Ireland, 42% of doctors were foreign born and 26% of nurses were foreign born. And I think that uh, this is a very good example that migrants were on the front line, were confronting the, the virus, 
to preserve the health of the entire community. And even more striking, uh, in a number of countries, especially in Europe, some seasonal crops depend a lot on migrant workforce. And some countries like the UK or Italy, they have all even authorized shuttle flights to facilitate the entry of uh, temporary workers, mainly from Eastern Europe or Northern Africa, in order to guarantee that the crops were not lost and that the seasonal agricultural works could be done effectively. So there are good examples. Having said that, and this is my last point, I still am very much concerned about the politicization of the migration debate, about the examples of the scapegoating migrants as virus carriers, and I'm uh, also concerned with the uh, profitability for populists from the crisis. And uh, that will require uh, in an, uh, a discussion about uh, what will be the future of mobility. Uh, we at IOM, we are discussing this issue thoroughly, internally for the time being. We have a dialogue with ICAO and with the International Maritime Organization, because those are two international agencies that are very much involved, <coughs> sorry, in uh, people's mobility. But my key concern is we will have to be imaginative and creative, recognizing that the future of mobility will depend on the way we reconcile, legitimate health security concerns with the principle of uh, movement of people that is unseparate from open societies, democratic societies, free trade, and uh, free movement of goods and services. And this is very challenging because we see some ideas coming up, tracking systems, apps to track people. We see immunity certificates. We see e-health declarations, a number of things that are coming up. They are not yet systematized but definitely they will have a say in the future of mobility. You remember that after the 9-11, the changes in the security for traveling, the liquids, the things you could not carry with you because they were potentially armed. Now, the, po the point is no longer the things you carry with you. Now you are the problem. You became the problem because you might be carrying with you the virus. And the, the main concern I have is that we should not let the establishment of a two-tier or even a three-tier system of countries as far as mobility is concerned. Some countries are more capable to set up the infrastructures and the necessary mechanisms to have border systems capable to assess the health condition of those who are traveling. But others won't have that possibility. And we might be creating a system where uh, the access to mobility will be uh, limited by uh, economic conditions, social condition, countries of origin, creating bubbles of movement that do not interoperate. And this is particularly important in countries where there is a high level of commuters across borders, working across borders and living in another country, which is, by the way, very typical here in Geneva where I'm today, but I'm sure that uh, you know that also in the, Irish, uh, in the Irish island, not just from the economic point of view, but also a very sensitive question from the political point of view. So we are at a crossroads. We are at a crossroads. Things can still evolve in a very negative way for the future of mobility. But things can also evolve in a more positive way if uh, we uh, are able to put on the table a fair, honest, reasonable, open conversation about how much we need mobility 
how much mobility can contribute for, for the development, not only of the countries of destination, but also for the countries of origin. There you have, David. Sorry for being so long. I tried to stick to the 20 minutes, but uh, the, the agenda, as the French say, on a du pain sur la planche. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Antonio. And uh, in fact, you were admirably concise uh, for what is a very, very complex and uh, ever widening agenda. Thank you so much on, be on behalf of the Institute. You, you delivered some very powerful messages there, both about the exposure of migrants to the virus in, in health terms, but also to its impact economically and socially. And I think you, all, you at the same time uh, noted that some states are uh, trying to row against the tide of, uh, of, of hostility, or perhaps the tide is exaggerated, but there is undoubtedly hostility in some quarters, but there are notable examples like Portugal and uh, a few other countries that we can, which can inspire us. I mean, I think Ireland also, uh, I would like to think, is in a reasonably supportive um, uh, um, uh, states in terms of, of, of migrant interests. And then you, talk, you talked in, 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 in a way in troubling terms about the threats which uh, will uh, arise in future to uh, mobility, uh, the kind of automatic mobility, open movement between uh, states that we have, we have committed to. You, you talked about the um, um, the restrictions which we may have to accept coming out of this. It was a wonderful presentation, Tony. Thank you so much and a lot to, to uh, reflect on. And I'd now like to invite um, uh, those participating in this event to ask Antonio uh, questions, to, to make comments, to uh, uh, react to um, some of the points he has raised. I should say that this is a, a discussion which is entirely on the public record. So um, uh, let me see, uh, have we any questions coming in already or, but otherwise I would invite people to use the function, I think it's at the bottom of the screen. Um, uh, maybe Antonio, just while people are gathering their, their thoughts, um, I, might, I might ask you just to explore a little bit further uh, what I think is a very interesting angle about IOM that it could itself be involved gradually in, uh, in, in supporting governments with their testing and screening arrangements. Because you already, if I understand correctly, IOM is already doing that de facto with its medical centers around the world with its labs. And one could, under the heading of future of mobility, one could imagine that IOM might eventually have a wider uh, remit to, to help, or at least it would support governments as they try to um, uh, to improve and accelerate their, their testing arrangements. Would you be able yeah. to say anything about that? Thank you, David. Well, uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, uh, he, he, I, I should have mentioned Ireland also as a very good example, because as far as I know, yeah, there has been a decision to renew for two months automatically the international protection and uh, migration measures. And uh, there's a, there's a, there has already been a second renewal. So that's also a very good example uh, in parallel with other countries uh, uh, in the world that I mentioned. So uh, I'm happy that you allowed me to uh, have a specific, a specific reference to Ireland that I appreciate very much. <laughs> Not as impressive as Portugal, but nevertheless. No, no, nevertheless. No, no, no. All, all good examples are helpful in this <laughs> current moment. Well, we are, um, David, you know very well IOM. IOM is a highly uh, projectized organization. So we have a project, we get the funding, we, we do the project. Fortunately, uh, donors have been very flexible in accepting uh, to reshift quite a number of projects that whether they are slowed down or even are blocked for the current situation uh, in order to uh, shift those projects towards supporting countries in uh, the fight against the, the pandemic. I could give you a long list of examples, but one of the most striking examples is precisely in Southern Africa and in East Africa and in West Africa, we have been deploying our medical staff to support national health systems who are very weak and were very much unprepared to confront 
this um, this uh, this pandemic. Uh, we are building capacity in those countries in terms of the hospital facilities to deal with uh, this uh, virus, and we are even training doctors and nurses uh, in this new ground of how to deal with a virus of which there are still many questions that remain unanswered. Uh, it's perceived as a threat. But fortunately, IOM had, had an experience with the Ebola crisis uh, in 2015 in West Africa and more recently in North Kivu in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And therefore, we are very much engaged in supporting uh, member states uh, in Africa in uh, uh, scaling up their capacity to respond to the pandemic, including, including uh, the uh, possibility of uh, having our networks doing the testing uh, and uh, uh, giving medical support. Because something that is not usually very well known is that IOM in the world has 60 clinics, 60, 60, 60 clinics. Uh, we have our 18 laboratories and we have uh, two teleradiology centers, one in Nairobi and the other one in Manila because we do quite a lot of work of health assessment of migrants before they move. And uh, all those movements are blocked now. So we are using and putting this capability, installed capacity uh, at the service, not only of the countries where we have them, but also of the entire UN system uh, to accomplish our duty of care, not only in relation to the UN staff, but also in relation to the implementing partners especially the NGOs that uh, worldwide work with us, are on the front line, humanitarian workers, aid workers, and of course they are very much exposed to the threat of the, of the virus. Looking ahead, looking for the future, we think that we are well positioned to uh, scale up this capacity and to put it at the service of uh, a mobility system that uh, uh, introduces health screening and health assessment uh, in the worldwide uh, uh, movement of people. So we are ready to uh, take up this challenge and even going beyond our mandate, because to be honest, we are very much focused on migrants, uh, but of course we do that quite a lot on internally displaced people, for instance, which are not exactly international migrants, but they are also in need of support from the uh, medical point of view. And with refugees, we have scaled up our capacities in Cox's Bazar. We have done quite a large upgrade of our capacities in West Africa and in the Sahel, and more recently in uh, East Africa, especially in Somalia and uh, in Kenya and in Djibouti. That's it. Thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, I must say, I, I think it's very impressive what you are doing in, in relation to the support for member states, particularly in Africa. Um, and, um, and indeed, you're working uh, also with IDPs, which in a strict sense um, is, is beyond the mandate. But the reality is that if IOM doesn't do it, nobody will do it. And, and IDPs are very much at the center of the crisis as well. Um, just turning to something else, Johnny, we're all uh, obviously anxious about what could develop in the, in the camps. Uh, we've seen the news about cases now, or a case, I think, in, in Lesbos, and then several cases in Costa Bazaar. You, you referred then to the, those on the Greek mainland as well. But one question from Karen Smith um, asks, is, is, there, is there more that can be done to manage uh, resettlement uh, and asylum um, uh, act activity in, in Europe in order to relieve the pressure on the camps? Is the more that we as a European Union should be doing over the next 12 to 18 months to actually uh, try to lower some of the pressure on the camps, which now could could really take off. I suppose another way of asking that question would be, what scope do you see for the uh, Asylum and Migration Pact, which I think is uh, is due to be brought to a conclusion over the next few months? Well, that's a very critical question. 
Uh, as you know, uh, IOM and UNHCR, uh, in agreement, have suspended the resettlement operations because of the closure of the borders and the travel restrictions. But what we can guarantee, I, both IOM and UNHCR, is that we have gone working, we have kept our work in the processing of asylum claims and in all the preparatory work so that when the um, borders are open, we will be ready to resume resettlement operations. But just to give you an example, the lockdowns in March created a backlog of 10,000 refugees uh, who are blocked, were already selected to move and they could not move because of the restrictions. So we are ready to make the, put them on the move. And uh, uh, up to now, uh, this is the positive side, up to now, no country that has accepted to take refugees for 2020 has uh, dropped their offer. So uh, the offer still stands. And therefore, it's a, just a practical question of being allowed to do the movement. Having said that, let's be honest, the numbers are uh, very much ahead, uh, beyond any capacity. Uh, no, just to put it very clearly, the numbers are very low in comparison to the needs. That's the way of putting it. Okay, uh, there has been a significant drop of uh, refugee resettlement for the United States. As you know, uh, the figures of Europe in a number of, of cases have gone up, but not enough to cover the gap created by the reduction of the US. And we are talking, for instance, in the Rohingya case of uh, almost 1 million people living in the Cox's Bazaar uh, camps. So resettlement uh, can only cope with a limited part of the refugees that are in the camps, mm -hmm. uh, which means that the vast majority will have to be addressed uh, by direct action in the camps, scaling up our medical capacities, prevention, 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 and trying to install uh, water stations, for instance, guaranteeing the access to water, which is one of the most critical challenges because you can say to people, you have to wash your hands several times a day. If you have no water, how can you wash your hands several times a day? We distribute disinfectant, but of course it's quite a huge challenge. And every day I fear what figures might come from the, from the refugees and the migrant camps. Over. Thanks, Antonio. In fact, I just, if I may, um, Come back to the the, 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 the the question of the European uh, the, the, the new pact on migration and asylum because I see that uh, Sophie McGuinness of UNHCR's uh, representation in Ireland has asked what hopes you have for the new uh, uh, asylum and migration pact. I think the Commission is meant to be publishing it soon. Well, we we are engaged in a dialogue with the European Commission about the pact. There are different dimensions to the pact that we consider equally relevant. Of course, one of them where uh, I believe IOM and UNHCR together can give an important contribution is precisely to deal with uh, the situation of migrants and refugees in uh, countries of origin and in countries of uh, transit, as we are doing in a number of places in the Sahel, in West Africa, in the East Africa, or, for instance, in Northern Africa, including in Libya. This part of the pact is extremely important because for, for two years now, we have, uh, together with the European Union uh, we, and with the African Union, a joint approach to uh, the situation in Libya. And uh, we think that this tripartite approach can be uh, extended and replicated in other parts of the African continent. And having these tripartite work, European Union, United Nations, mainly IOM and UNHCR, and the African Union, brings added value to the cooperation to deal with the situation of uh, uh, asylum seekers and, uh, and migrants. The second dimension is an internal dimension to the European Union. 
uh, which in the internal dimension, there are also two strings that should be taken into consideration. One is the internal solidarity of Europe. And that has been a, a crucial issue. Without re-establishing mutual trust and a sort of uh, uh, agreed system of uh, sharing solidarity among the European member states, it will be very difficult to have uh, a, a, a pact on asylum and migration that is worth the name. And the second uh, string is the connection between the situation in the Mediterranean and especially the issue of the disembarkation, disembarkation of those who are trying to cross the Mediterranean. Uh, the figures show that uh, there has been a slight decrease in crossing the Mediterranean in the Western Mediterranean uh, in relation to Spain. There has been a slight increase in arrivals in Central Mediterranean, especially to Malta and to Italy. And the figures uh, on the Eastern Mediterranean, mainly in relation to the, the Greek islands, are, uh, as far as at the end of April, at the same level of last year by the same period of the, of the year. The figures are very far from 2015, of course. We are talking about uh, 7,000 people arriving in Greece. We are talking about uh, more or less the same figure of arrivals in, um, in Italy, and we are talking about 5,000 people arriving in Spain. The problem is that those are very dangerous, dangerous trips, especially in central Mediterranean. And we have always said that Libya is not a safe port of, of disembarkation. And the COVID-19 crisis brought also more confusion on the possibility of disembarkation and save and rescue in central Mediterranean. So there is a need uh, when it comes to the European Union to clarify uh, the rules, and the principles for guaranteeing safe disembarkation of those who are rescued in the Mediterranean. Over. Thank you very much, Antonio. Um, Donald Cronin of Irish Aid asks about the global compact on migration uh, and the extent to which that can be relevant to uh, a coordinated um, response to the, to the crisis. Do, do, you, do you see it as something useful and relevant, uh, or is it possibly masking further, or is it, does it contain the seeds for further conflict? Well, as you can imagine, migration as a whole and the refugees as a whole uh, are not exactly on top of the agenda of the countries because the response to the COVID-19 crisis was mainly closing borders and turning inwards. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, uh, the issues will come up to the top of the agenda uh, after when, when the pandemic slows down and hopefully it will come back to the top of the agenda in the best positive way possible. Uh, but there is a danger that it, will, it might come back in, in, a negative, in a negative way. We don't know yet. As far okay. as the Global Compact is concerned, I think that there are a number of principles of the Global Compact that are very, ex are very talkative about this crisis. I've just given you an example. Access to health care, for instance. Let's be honest, one of the problems we have everywhere when it comes to migrants access to health care is that uh, migrants need to understand the advantages they also get to have access to health care. It's not just a question of the countries being a little bit reluctant in accepting access from of migrants irrespective of their legal status to the health care. It's also all the way around. Migrants being suspicious of getting in touch with the healthcare system, of being tested, of being uh, identified, uh, because they are afraid that there will be consequences for their status if they attend. So there is a problem of mutual trust that needs to be created when it comes to universal healthcare, which is clearly stated in the, in the Global Compact in terms of access to access to services. There are two key points this year for the Global Compact. One is the regional review, the regional review of the Global Compact, because it was adopted in December 2018 in Marrakesh, 
and uh, now we will take stock of how the different regions in the world have used the global compact in their migration policies. And that will happen in the last quarter of this year, in, in person or virtually, one never knows. The second key element this year for the Global Compact will be the first biannual report of the Secretary General. The Secretary General is supposed to report back to the General Assembly uh, in December on the uh, assessment of the UN system in terms of the implementation of the Global uh, Compact. And that will give uh, high visibility, visibility to the Global Compact. Last but not least, how is the Global Compact an instrument to deal with the current, the current crisis? I think that uh, uh, what has uh, happened clearly is that uh, uh, the, the values and the principles of the Global Compact have been uh, uh, implemented by the countries uh, in a very asymmetric way. Well, I'm not counting those countries who did not subscribe to the Global Compact. Those 12 did not implement the Global Compact, of course. But those who have subscribed to the Global Compact have implemented it uh, in a very uh, asymmetric way. But there is one very important point, is that this, the UN system has taken ownership of, of the Global Compact. The UN Migration Network, the multi partner trust fund that was created by the Global Compact is already in action. There is a first set of projects to be funded by the multi partner trust fund. The UN Migration Network has made a number of statements on returns, on uh, deportations, on alternatives to detention, on protection to the children, all in line with the principles of the Global Compact, bringing together the entire UN system. And at national level and regional level, UN country teams have created replications of the, Global Compact, of the UN Migration Network on the basis of the Global Compact. So there, is, there are systems of coordination of all agencies in the field around migration in, well, something like almost 100 and something countries in the world. So from that point of view, the Global Compact has been a leverage to coherence and consistency in working together in the United Nations. Over. Thanks, John Liu. Um, another question, Valerie Hughes asks about what about IOM's work in Syria. Could you say something about that? Well, we, uh, our, our operations in Syria are basically cross-border operations. We implement them departing from uh, uh, Gaziantep in Turkey, and uh, we provide uh, shelter, blankets, uh, non-food items, food items to uh, Syrians that are displaced, both in the northeast and in the northwest. The situation in northwest is uh, very difficult because there are almost one million people stranded there and uh, in the middle of the conflict between uh, the Turkish controlled zones and the a government of Damascus controlled zones. The good news is that uh, there has been uh, a sort of uh, informal or implicit ceasefire. So the situation has become less dramatic due to a slowdown of the conflict, but, but the humanitarian situation is still extremely vulnerable, extremely precarious, and those people are there uh, stranded, uh, blocked, have no, no hope, no future, and we depend quite a lot on the cross-border operations. And uh, since there is the resolution of the Security Council that allowed the UN system, um, mainly IOM, WHO, and uh, WFP, and uh, UNICEF, to operate in the Northeast and in the Northwest uh, through the cross-border operation, this resolution comes to an end in July. And uh, uh, of course, the support to those people uh, will depend on the extension of the UN Security Council resolution. Otherwise, we might be confronted with a very dramatic humanitarian crisis 
in those areas of, uh, of Syria. In the rest uh, of uh, Syria, of course, uh, there are four, and, uh, four to five million dis internally displaced people who also depend quite heavily on the support uh, of the international uh, community. And therefore, there are actions uh, to uh, prevent the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, in those very fragile uh, environments. And those actions are mainly led by WHO in close coordination with, uh, uh, with uh, UNICEF and uh, WFP. Over. Thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, Susan Murphy of Trinity College Dublin brings up the, the issue of sort of isolationist attitudes that we see on the part of certain uh, countries and the US would be one example with border closures and redu reduction of funding to uh, uh, international organizations, you'll be aware of that. I mean, is there, um, wh what is your attitude towards that? And, and can you say something about the role of smaller states um, or less powerful states in trying to counter those tendencies? What, what can we do to try to uh, preserve the values of multilateralism? Well, I, I think that the, the, the first line of response to the COVID-19 has been a closure of borders, looking inward, inwards, a sort of uh, a strictly national approach. But uh, everybody realizes that uh, if no one is safe, uh, we will not all be safe. Uh, and that is a very powerful argument. Uh, and there are good signs in that respect. For instance, uh, the international scientists, researchers, medical doctors are cooperating in trying to find a vaccine as it has never happened in the past. And that is very uh, encouraging. But there is a second issue closely linked to this one. We need to have a multilateral international approach to access to vaccine. It is not just a question of cooperating in discovering the vaccine. It's also a question of making sure that everybody is entitled to the vaccine. And this is not something new. You can recall the debate in the late 90s about access to retrovirals in the, UA, in the AIDS, uh, HIV uh, disease. We are going back to that point again. How can we guarantee that the countries, irrespective of their economic wealth, can provide their citizens with access to vaccine at an affordable price? And uh, we are talking about, uh, if we come to the vaccine, and everybody hopes that there will be a vaccine, that the vaccine will bring immunization, at least for a certain period of time, we are confronted with a paramount operation of vaccination worldwide, which has never been seen in our history. So this can only be done on the basis of international cooperation. This cannot be done on a pure national basis. Otherwise, we will create a healthy world and an unhealthy world divided by the economic power. That is totally uh, unacceptable. And so uh, I, I think that uh, there are strong arguments for multilateral. And I think that small countries who have no hidden agenda should be at the forefront of making the case and the advocacy for equal treatment to all mankind. We are all entitled to have access to the vaccine in the name of human dignity. And uh, uh, those countries who are small in size can be very big if they use authoritative moral arguments. Thank you very much, Antonio. And in a way that that replies uh, to a question which uh, Una Buckley of our Department of Justice has asked, I think you know Una, um, and, and she raises the question about what Ireland, what a country like Ireland can do to, uh, to support um, uh, better treatment for migrants um, and, and refugees. Um, 
I, I can I come to a question from Daniel Korolev, who picks up on the issue about um, uh, recognition of migrant workers, um, and he, he asks whether um, there is a risk. I mean, does that mean that if we go down that road, uh, which is a very important road, is there a risk that uh, somebody has to be seen to be useful to the host country before he gets support? Uh, does it in some way? I mean, paraphrase it. Does it in some way dilute the basic need to protect lives and sub and support human rights? Well, it's, it's, it's a question that needs to be seen, uh, uh, put into perspective. Are we talking about refugees or are we talking about migrants? Because those are different uh, realities. I mean, people who are asylum seekers and refugees, they are entitled to international protection, okay? But that is not a question of usefulness for the country of destination. It's a legal obligation coming from international law. And what is at center stage is the threat to the life of the asylum seeker and refugee and the obligation for those countries who have subscribed to the international humanitarian law to give protection. When it comes to migrants, we are not talking about the same situation. We are talking about uh, people who uh, want to have a better life, are in search for it. They move because they want to find a better life for them and for their families. And of course, uh, the personal happiness of those people are extremely important and relevant and at the basis of the motivation of the movement. But they can only be happy and fully realized as human beings if they find uh, a job and if they can be integrated in the country of destination. And so there is a trade-off there, a trade-off between the benefits for the migrant themselves that improve their life, that can be fully integrated and be happy, and at the same time, their contribution to the country of destination, to the host country, to the country that they have received them. And uh, uh, as I've tried to demonstrate to you, uh, the rhetorics of the ones who just want to accept the Einsteins of the world, the genius of the world, the highly skilled, I've just given you a few examples where mm. critical people are not particularly highly skilled and nevertheless, they have been essential to guarantee that life would go on in spite of the lockdowns in our own cities in the developed, uh, in the developed world. Thank you, Antonio. Um, Sirica Pollock, who's with the Irish Times, has a couple of questions, but I'll just uh, pose one of them to you. She, she, coming back to the issue of the number of cases we've seen in Cox's Bazaar and uh, on uh, in Lesbos and so on, the figures which you mentioned, which we've seen, strictly speaking, seem a bit low, but, but many people presume that in reality they're much higher. Can you estimate in any way uh, what you think the actual level might be in, in, in refugee camp settings? And are, is there any chance of more comprehensive testing being carried out in camps? Oh. Maybe you could say that the, the, the figures are low everywhere. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> I mean, this is such a tricky virus <laughs> that uh, with, with people with non-symptoms, nobody can give you a figure, <laughs> an accurate scientific figure, bulletproof figure, not even in the developed world. Uh, there are different uh, reasons that might explain why the figures are uh, so low in some parts of the world. For instance, uh, and the reporting being one of them, definitely. Lack of capacity of the health system to identify people who might be uh, infected. Uh, in other cases, there might be explanations linking temperature and humidity. It's a, a, an unknown question about mm. how the virus uh, uh, behaves in different uh, environments, weather environments. Another one is also the age. The question of the age, what we have seen in the developed world is that uh, um, older people are more prone to get infected than younger people. And when you look to those camps, the majority of the, the population in the camps are relatively young people. Uh, which might, for their DNA and metabolism, 
be more resistant to the virus or at least uh, get infected without symptoms or with uh, mild uh, symptoms. Of course, the capacity of, for testing is a very relevant element in this exercise. And let's be very, very clear. Uh, we have some access to tests, but there is a jungle out there in the fight for testing, okay? <laughs> it's not very easy to get, uh, to get the testing. We are supporting quite a number of countries and we work very closely with the Center for Prevention of Diseases in uh, Africa to help uh, African countries to get access to testing. But uh, uh, testing has become a very mobile uh, market where if you do not buy in the minute, five minutes later, you won't get any more chance to buy it. And if you do not pay up front, <laughs> you, do, you are not delivered. So uh, there is also that explanation, the difficulty of accessing to tests and making sure that the picture we have is more accurate. So in a nutshell, I can accept that most likely the figures are low due to underreporting or lack of testing, but there might be also other explanations that uh, at the current moment I cannot discard uh, and uh, I don't know what's going to be the evolution. Uh, that, uh, that I cannot anticipate. Johnny, we have time for one more question and, uh, uh, and that is from Ethna McDermott, who's a member of the Institute. And, Esna asks about the gender dimension to the various set of uh, migration challenges that you're facing as an organization, both in relation to COVID-19 and, and more generally. What, what can you tell us about the gender perspective? Oh, as, as in many other crises, women and girls are particularly uh, targeted uh, by the socioeconomic uh, impact of the of the crisis mainly in countries of origin maybe this is not absolutely the case in countries of destination where uh, if we look to the 2008 crisis uh, young men uh, young male uh, were more targeted by the financial crisis than women uh, and girls in the countries of destination but definitely from the perspective of uh, uh, large crowds or living in overcrowded livelihoods, uh, women are particularly vulnerable. And we have already quite a number of reports that show a rise in violence against women, gender-based violence, and uh, in uh, um, vulnerabilities of girls. One of the most disturbing thing is that with the closure of the schools, some people have made assumptions, I hope they will not prove to be right, that 30% of the girls that uh, stopped attending school because of the closure of schools will not go back to school when the schools mm -hmm. reopen. So I think that we need to be very much attentive to this kind of micromanagement of the social and economic impacts of the crisis. And if I had to pick one up front, I would say, we need to make sure that all the girls that were attending school before the crisis will be able to go back to school when the schools reopen. Otherwise, there will be an enormous human loss for them. Thank you, David. Thank you, Antonio. That's a very powerful note on which to uh, end this discussion. Thank you so much for having given so generously of your time. Uh, I found it fascinating. It was a real tour de force across a very, very challenging agenda. And I have to say from all the comments and questions, um, and many of which unfortunately we couldn't reach, everybody was hugely impressed by your presentation today. Uh, and they all wanted to convey that to you. So we're very, very grateful uh, in the Institute. Thank you so much. A lot to, uh, to take away. Um, and um, uh, all I can do is thank you uh, once again, wish you uh, all the best with IOM's ongoing work in relation to this crisis and, and, and more generally. So Antonio, thank you very, very much for your time. And I thank all of those who uh, 
took part today. May I just make one final point before maybe letting Antonio have a couple of words. Um, the next uh, uh, meeting of the Institute um, uh, on Development Matters will be on the 3rd of June when the President of the ICRC, Peter Maurer, will speak to us. Antonio, would you like to, to, to finish off? <laughs> David, just to just thank you so much for the invitation, thank the Institute, thank the support of uh, Irish Aid. Uh, of course, we are all now used to this kind of uh, remote uh, contact, but I hope next time I can be uh, in person in Dublin, because there is not yet a solution of uh, sending me a beer by virtual means. <laughs> <laughs> we work on it. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you very much, Antonio. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye.